Blog Talk Radio. What's your problem? Sorry for the late start there, folks. Uh, my dog is having a fit about what I don't know yet. So, Welcome back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. I have been buried to a degree in the book called The Might of Thoughts, Mach der Gedanken in the German. Um, on page 160, and I'm looking at one of those verses in the Meyer material that is incredibly important and has a lot of meaning in it. And I'm going to try to share my limited understanding of this particular verse. Right now it's on page 160. It says, Only a conscious or an unconscious purposefulness is able to bring one's thoughts to fruition. The unconscious is the part of the mind that's inaccessible to our conscious mind. We don't really know what's going on in the unconscious too much. I think sometimes we have some ideas, but the unconscious mind, it affects the behavior and emotions. In Freud's psychoanalytic theory, Uh, He says the unconscious mind is a reservoir of feelings, thoughts, urges, memories. And a lot of these are outside our awareness. And most of the contents of our unconscious are unacceptable and unpleasant, uh, such as feelings of pain, anxiety, or conflict. At least that's according to Freud. Uh, The unconscious continues to influence our behavior and experience, even though we are unaware of these underlying influences. So the first thing Billy says here is only a conscious or an unconscious purposefulness is able to bring one's thoughts to fruition. Uh, A purpose is something set up as an object or an end to be attained. So purposefulness means that we have a the quality of of working towards a specific object or an end. So our both our conscious and our unconscious purposefulness is able to bring our thoughts into reality. So that means you have unconscious thoughts that have caused things to occur in your life. And your conscious mind probably didn't want them to occur. And that's, that's probably why we feel like a lot of times we're a victim of circumstances. Well, you have to factor in the unconscious thoughts uh, that are infect, uh, affecting us and maybe infecting us, so to speak. So the intention or setting of the zeal, which is kind of 
the ultimate endpoint, can thereby be created completely consciously or unconsciously. Because the thought can in fact only be fulfilled and brought into fruition when there is definite intention. Now, the key word there, Billy says, is only intelligently fulfilled and brought into into fruition when there is a definite intention. So maybe the unconscious mind brings thoughts into reality in an unintelligent way, in a way we don't really want. Now, there's something called striving in the Meyer material. And it's a creation of natural law, and it means to work towards some purpose or some end. And generally speaking, we're told to evolve our consciousness as our primary uh, goal, zeal, in striving. But we have unconscious strivings. So the... uh, The Might of Thoughts continues on page 160 and says the fact that not only unconscious striving towards the zeal, but rather are not only conscious striving towards the zeal, an end point, rather also unconscious ones are thereby able to come into fruition due to the nature and the might of thoughts. So let me kind of put this all together and I know it's kind of boring to be read to, but I'll just read a few paragraphs here on page 160. It says, Only a conscious or an unconscious purposefulness is able to bring one's thoughts to a fruition. Therefore, the might of the thoughts is only effective when there is a definite intention, indeed a setting of the zeal connected with the thoughts. The intention or setting of a zeal can thereby be created completely consciously or unconsciously. What is thereby important is only that such a setting of a zeal exists because a thought can in fact only be intelligently fulfilled and brought into fruition when there is a definite intention. And that is to say a definite setting of a zeal. The fact that not only conscious strivings towards the zeal, but also unconscious ones are thereby able to come to fruition is due to the nature of the might of the thoughts. This is part of the the really profound quality of the Meyer material. When you read his books, of course, I'm reading from the might of thoughts and Mach der Gedanken on page 160. Yeah, I've read this book three times. I'm going back over it the fourth time extremely slowly at times because you you get these such important material. So our thinking should have a purposefulness about it. And when it has a purposefulness and we set these zeals, these endpoints, these culmination points, then our thoughts can come to fruition because we're, th- we're, we're supposed to be steering our thoughts. This is part of the, the spiritual teaching is learning constantly to be looking at your thoughts and to be steering those thoughts. Book that we're talking about originally was going to be an article for something called The Voice of the Aquarian Age. And then they turned it into a brochure, and then eventually it became a book. It it first appeared as a brochure, and it's really about learning to control our thoughts. And in the beginning of the book, it compares the evolution of our consciousness to a tree. So we have the visible part of the tree, the trunk and the crown, which embodies the external realm of life, while the roots symbolize the inner realm. So we have this internal and external aspect. And if the external and the internal growth is in balance, 
then the tree is firmly rooted. It can withstand the weather. It can withstand the wind. But if it's out of balance, the external and internal growth, that's when trees tend to fall down. And that's when we have problems in our life. Trees are very interesting things, too. They've been on Earth about 370 million years. They play a significant role in reducing erosion and moderating the climate. The forests are critical in moderating the climate. And it's very interesting that the trees form a kind of root system, forming a colony. And these, if you cut a tree down, which I don't recommend, there is concentric circles inside the tree that you can see, which are called tree rings. These are called annual growth rings. And also, our universe has concentric circles. There are seven layers in our universe, the Meyer material says, seven concentric circles. We live in the fourth layer, which is the material belt. So we see these repeating patterns in nature, the concentric circles inside a tree growth, the concentric circles that exist in the universe, uh, the spiraling arms of a galaxy, the spiraling of our DNA, the spiraling of the seashell, the branching structure of trees. We've just been talking about trees. We get a branching structure in our circulatory system. We have a branching structure that appears when lightning appears in, the, in our sky. Unfortunately, the humans on the earth are ill in their consciousness. And there's a a wonderful quote in this book by a lady named Elizabeth Mooseberger who says, So the book which lies before you is dedicated to a humankind that is ill in its consciousness, so that it finds again the creational natural way which it it lost uh, long ago. Now, Billy and Elizabeth Mooseberger were friends of Billy. And they're mentioned in Contact Report 239. In 1991, uh, Billy and Elizabeth Mooseberger saw a fantastic spectacle. They saw three disc-shaped UFOs that were some 300 meters in diameter. And these exhibited a pulsing and a rightward rotating motion. They were a whitish color, and these were large, three large spaceships from the neighboring Dow universe. The ships were on an exploration and research flight into our universe, and they also inspected the Semyase Silver Star Center. Our universe is something like 46 trillion years old, according to Meyer information, and we have this parallel universe called the Dow universe. And that's where these uh, UFOs were from, these disks. One of Billy's contacts, his second contact, is a woman named Askett. She's from the Dow universe, from a race of people called the Timmers. Billy met with her in 1953 for the first time. Um, She sent one of her robotic crafts to Switzerland and Billy got in that craft and flew all the way to Egypt and went under the Great Pyramid with Askett, and they saw a group of extraterrestrials called the Giza Intelligences, and maybe we'll talk more about them tonight. I talk about them often, but they were a splinter group of the player and themselves that had kind of disregarded the spiritual teachings, and they were criminals, um, and they have been influencing the consciousness on the people of the earth for quite some time. And they use religions and all sorts of um, technologies to affect our mind. And they really wanted to gain control of the earth. They had their own nefarious intentions. Now there's a Figu bulletin that's... And then in that Figu bulletin, there's an ancient proverb. It says, everyone is the smith of his own success, luck, or happiness. Everyone is the architect of his own fortune. 
And the Meyer material says you make your own luck. Now, one of the aspects of making your own luck requires us to think independently. And think, thinking independently eventually causes an evolution of our consciousness. Now, unfortunately, on our planet, thinking independently is rare. We live in a con- consumer society. Everything is pre-chewed and television, radio, newspapers, magazines affect people's thinking very much. And it's hard to imagine that we actually live in a society where independent thinking is rare. Independent thinking leads to the evolution of your consciousness. Today, people are told how to think. And the media tells them how to think. The churches tell them how to think. Various organizations tell us how to think. Now, a thought is an idea or opinion produced by thinking. Today, our ideas and opinions come from the media. And so, we, our society, doesn't support independent thinking anymore. And that's why um, things are in a very, very strange state here, especially in the U.S., where we have... I think about half the population that thinks independently, or at least thinks independently part of the time or most of the time. And then there's a group, about half of the people, which rarely think independently. And the two groups are pretty much in conflict right now. Um, at one of the things is that Ask It Told Billy about this whole independent thinking. Uh, In Askett's Explanations, Part 5, Askett said the human, meaning the earth human, is still not capable of coping with the truth, understanding the truth, and, and we're not yet mature enough to know our future and approach it correctly. So, we have been given these prophecies. And these prophecies are designed to help us think independently so we can slowly find and recognize the truth. Now, part of these prophecies come in Contact Report 215. One of the prophecies, which I'm really hoping doesn't occur, although I think the Meyer people are saying it's almost a prediction at this point. It's almost certainly going to occur. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, is that we're going to have a civil war in the United States. Now, I'm still holding out that we have hope, and that's one of the reasons I do this radio show, trying to educate myself and pass on a little knowledge, if I can, to to those people that are willing to listen. So there's a a prophecy which says we may have a civil war and that the U.S. could break up into five independent areas. Um, Let's hope that doesn't happen. The Meyer material doesn't speak very positively of either one of the presidential candidates, I personally, but it does say that we avoided a nuclear war by not uh, electing Hillary. I I happen to be a Trump fan. I try not to say that too much, at least especially during the Meyer information. Uh, But even in the Meyer, in people that respect Billy Meyer, there's, I think, a division uh, that's occurred. And one of the things that we have to try to avoid is something called a sartan, which means to get very bad out of the control of the good human nature. And our own negative thinking can lead to a sartan, so can positive thinking. We need to have neutral positive thinking. And what you think, your thoughts, good thoughts can produce good feelings. Good feelings and thoughts can lead to good habits. And once you develop good habits, 
your circumstances in your life tend to be good, and that's how you make your own luck. So we need to have conscious purposefulness to bring our thoughts into fruition. And the might of our thoughts becomes in effective when we start to have a definite intention. So we have to learn to stop doing the things we don't want to do. We do things we don't want to do. Isn't that strange? Now think about that. You do things, I do things, because we're influenced by our unconscious mind and what are called automatic thoughts. And one of the ways to fight these automatic thoughts, these unpleasant thoughts, are wish dreams. And if they're good, healthy, neutral wishes, it'll be like a plant sprouting a seed and something good can come forth from that. And it's interesting, but our thinking is also related to the afterlife. Um, We have a spirit form, which is you can think of your inner eye. We have a material consciousness as well. We have a spiritual consciousness and a material consciousness. And there's a great movie out on YouTube by Michael Udibrook of Figu Lands Group Canada called Reincarnation in the Spirit Form. And I recommend that you make that something you watch on a a regular basis. What happens is the spirit form enters in to the body of a child at 21 days after the sperm fertilizes the egg, and it brings with it a new consciousness, a new material consciousness, that consists of a personality, a subconscious mind, and an unconscious mind. And buried somewhere in that unconscious, subconscious area are memories related to your previous lives. Your entire previous life's information is stored also in something called the Universal Storage Banks, the Solar System Storage Banks, and the storage banks associated with the earth. Now, there's a way, I don't have that ability myself as far as I know, but there's a way to pour, pull information from the storage banks of the universe, the solar system, and or the earth. And I think the older your spirit form gets, this is just my own supposition, the older your spirit form gets, the more you start to learn to do this. Now, Billy, when he was very young, could do this. And he did it, I think, automatically, maybe from his own unconscious mind. And there's this very fascinating story called What the Truth Knows to Say. And it talks about, in, I think, in the early 40s, Billy went out a lower window in his bedroom and sat down on a bench that his father made, and he looked up at the beautiful starry sky, and he said, my, lo- my life is made out of the love of creation. And he said, since ancient times, I've lived among the stars. And he suddenly knew what the purpose of his life was. And he said things like, the infinite love of creation connects all life, because in all life, this love lies hidden. So Billy had these great epiphanies as a very young boy, and he started to get these impulses from the storage banks, which are kind of like signals. And his unconscious mind and his subconscious mind was, were picking up these signals, and eventually they bubbled up into the conscious mind. So you have to understand that Billy, according to Meyer information, is is very unusual. And if you read his writings, you'll start to appreciate that in a little more depth. He is said to be what is called the universal prophet. What, you, what that means is his spirit form is very, very ancient, and it has a special 
role among spirit forms here on the earth is that in that it incarnates with the purpose of speeding up evolution on given planets. And it's done this before in ancient times, in what's called Ur times, on other worlds and other solar systems and in other galaxies. And on Earth, his spirit form has lived as Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel. It's also had lives. It lived as Socrates. It lived as Aristotle, Mendelssohn, Mozart. Lived um, as Galileo Galilei. Uh, it also lived in ancient, even more ancient times. My understanding is a person named Semyasa incarnated twice. And most of the time this spirit form incarnates. It's a teacher and it's a prophet. And it's done it on this world. It's done it on other worlds. The player and extraterrestrial humans that Billy has had contact with, it took them uh, decades of interaction with him to realize that his spirit form had incarnated as Nocodamian, which was their ancient spiritual teacher. Now, they knew he had been a spiritual teacher on the earth before, and that's one of the reasons Billy had contacts with Svath. Now, Svath was a thousand-year-old extraterrestrial his, from a race of beings that are called the Playar, and they they don't live in our space and time configuration. Um, they live some 80 light years beyond our Pleiades. Sometimes they're erroneously called the Pleiadians. But they live some 80 light years beyond our Pleiades. And they have a world around the star system. Evidently, our universe is broken up into these different space-time configurations. Their world is called Era, and their people are way, way ahead of us in spiritual growth. Um, And their world is very different. One of the things they emphasize, and I know this is going to ring a bell for people that are of a, uh, have studied certain alternative um, information. You know, one of the things that I've always um, in the beginning, uh, part of my study of the Meyer material, I did not understand the significance of human population. And I never understood. I mean, we've got these two viewpoints, which I think, how can I say this? Um, as time goes on, I think people are going to realize more and more the danger of overpopulation. Uh, I hope, because otherwise it's going to be a, a lot like a parody show that we're living through. Uh, let me just give you an example. For I had a Frosty Wooldridge on the show the 19th of this month, and one of the things he told me that um, the Chinese had this incredible traffic jam, which I kind of knew about. I think he mentioned it in his book. Uh, it was something like 200 miles long. It lasted for weeks. They had to helicopter food out to people and water so people that stuck in this traffic jam didn't die or starve to death or whatever. And um, well, the thing I didn't know in one of these traffic jams is they had 50 lanes of traffic. Now, that's so absurd. 50 lanes of traffic going in one direction in Beijing. Beijing is about 13 million people, something like that. It's roughly the population of Ohio crammed into one city. And that's what's happening more and more all over the earth, is these tremendous populations um, are appearing in different areas. And and the one, uh, China, of course, has billions of people. And that's the most egregious example that I can think of off the top of my head. And maybe we'll um, talk a little more about population 
tonight. That's another thing we could veer off on. But I want to kind of stick on our thinking. I talked a little bit about the importance of conscious and unconscious purposefulness in terms of bringing one's thoughts into fruition. This is one of the the great teachings of the Meyer material, that the might of thoughts is effective when there is a definite intention. And as a young boy, Billy started to recognize the power of his own thoughts. And I'm sure his first teacher, Thoth, started to tell him about these, the power of our thoughts. You know, Thoth used to land his silvery pear-shaped craft up in Bulak, Switzerland, in the area of Bulak, Switzerland. And he would take young Billy up in the ship and start to teach him about his lifetime and how he was going to be a prophet and a teacher and started to teach him about the spiritual teachings. And I just wonder if Spoth, Spoth ever mentioned that our consciousness is like a garden. Because one of the Billy, one of the writings here, one of the analogies that I think is great is the garden analogy. And the idea that our consciousness is like a garden. Uh, and we know that some form of plants will come out of our garden. Regardless of whether the land is cultivated or not, or even if it's grossly neglected, your, your garden is going to produce something. So if you can take the time to weed your consciousness, your consciousness is like a garden. And if you can weed it and you can take out these wildly growing negative thoughts that have a confusing and destructive effect. So pay close attention to your thoughts because unhealthy negative thoughts tend to repeat out of control wildly. And when your thoughts start to repeat out of control wildly, that's when you start to do things that you're going to regret. Or you can drive yourself literally crazy or put yourself in such a distressed state of mind. So what you need to learn to do is clarify your thoughts. Make your thoughts more harmonious, more equalized, which takes a lot of effort. So clarify your thoughts, put forth the effort, practice doing that, it takes patience, and then you can have a harmonious life. One of the creational natural laws is the law of harmony. We're supposed to have a harmonious life, and to have a harmonious life, you have to have harmonious thinking. Now, to clarify your thinking means to make it clear and easier to understand, to clear out the confusion and the ambiguity. One of the things that confusion does is break down the borders between things. And when you have more clarity, you have more separation, you can see the borders between things. You know, when your thoughts become wildly negative, they're just a confusion of morass. Everything is mixed up in there. And what you're, one of the things you're doing when you strike out or, you know, go into anger is you're really struggling for control of self because emotion has erupted like a volcano. Emotions are not, do not come from thoughts. Feelings come from thoughts. Emotions, they much stem from the unconscious mind or the subconscious mind. They're very primitive. They run wildly, and they can do great damage. Now, again, confusion means a lack of understanding. Uncertainty. It also, uncertainty it also means to pour things together. So one of the things we're trying to do is clarify our thoughts. And when you can start to clarify your thoughts, then good plants start to grow in your garden. And these good plants are your, your good thoughts. Your thoughts grow and they expand. Now, on the other hand, if you think negative repeating thoughts you're going to become a disturbed human thing 
a human being that can only think in terms of negative, disturbing, disturbing thoughts. And your thoughts will be forced into a rotation whereby the negative, disturbing thoughts repeat over and over again. And this can happen. It can interrupt your sleep patterns and you'll be stuck thinking about negative things in your sleep patterns and you can't seem to um, recover. I mean, you can lose sleep this way. Uh, it breaks down your immune system. Um, you, sometimes listening to nice music, uh, a a wish dream, put yourself back in the time in your life. And this is where your meditation skills kick in a little bit. Just kind of lay down, relax, and think about a very, very happy time in your life or an imagined possible future scenario of happiness. And if even if your little vision only lasts 10 seconds, you've made one step in the right direction. So over time, you can become the Lord and Master of your thinking, and thereby the Lord and Master of your entire life. So you need to practice, we all need to practice self-cognition, self-examination, and then you can start to have self-control then. And that which you think you're going to make real in your life, good and positive thoughts, they must be tended and nurtured. You need to f try to have a good, positive opinion about yourself. That's very important. Nurture means to support, to encourage. Uh, cherish means to hold something dear. So these good thoughts, you have to learn, hold, them, hold them dear. And take special time to practice things like meditation, which clears your thoughts. Meditation is designed to stop you from thinking. And sometimes, after you've won the battle of a certain level of um, clarity from thinking, most of the time Billy talks about focusing on an image, particularly, uh, and this is uh, something I've yet to do that I probably should do. I haven't really done the candle meditation yet. But I do a, a meditation, a secondary kind of meditation, where you imagine um, things like a golden, a golden rose or a red rose, or focus on these kind of images in your mind and hold on to them, <clears throat> and that can give you a break from thinking, because you need to have a break from your thoughts. Otherwise, you can have big problems. Uh, your thoughts can run out of control. And, and bad thoughts can lead to more bad thoughts. And so the, the thinking becomes very critical in our life. And, and learning to control our thinking is very important. I'm going to pay play just a clip of nature sounds for a little bit and I'll be right back. You're listening to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host Mark Snyder. to welcome all of you back. You're listening to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. We're talking about the Billy Meyer case and uh, just a little excerpt from The Might of Thoughts on page 160. Let me go back to this real quick. 
Only a conscious or unconscious purposefulness is able to bring one's thoughts to fruition. Therefore, the might of the thoughts is only effective when there is a definite intention, a setting of a zeal connected with the thoughts. So, this is part of the spiritual teachings. Um, I talk very briefly. I started to talk about the reincarnation of the spirit form, the law of becoming and the law of passing. And that um, death lives right beside of life here on the earth. And one of the things that we need to remember is that we human beings are like the waves on an ocean. We are connected with each other through the mass of the water. And as it is with the life of the human being, a wave has a beginning and an end, a becoming and a passing. And as a part piece of the universal consciousness, the human being is a unity with all other creational spirit part pieces, with the creation of itself. And we our spirit form has its own identity. Our lives have their own identity. And thus also they're like waves of the ocean. And and the waves in the ocean have their own existence. They become and then they pass. And that's the law of becoming and passing, the law of reincarnation. Now your your spark, your spirit form resides in an area of your middle brain called the superior colliculus. And in the midbrain, that's where your sight is controlled. And when your gaze shifts from one thing to the next, it brings that superior colliculus into action. Now, your spirit form lasts between lifetimes. It comes into the body of a child 21 days after the sperm fertilizes the egg. It sends its energy throughout the whole body. It brings in a new consciousness, a new material consciousness, with the unconscious, the subconscious, and the conscious mind. It has a new personality. The spirit form brings in... So every human being is kind of a dual-purpose machine. We have a material consciousness and a spiritual consciousness. Your spiritual consciousness isn't focused on the daily things of life. It, it doesn't, it's not paying attention when you're driving. It isn't interacting with um, the world in that way. It's not conscious in that way. Like your conscious mind is driving your car, you're pressing the gas pedal, you're putting on the brakes at the right time. Your spirit form is impulsing your consciousness. And it's also receiving impulses from your material consciousness. Your material consciousness is the the, the your current life in this personality. You have a factor called the psyche, which controls the thoughts and the feelings in your material consciousness. You have something called the gemut in the spirit form, which controls the thoughts and the feelings of your spirit form. Now, you do have thoughts and feelings associated with that spirit form, but it's not really conscious the way your material consciousness is. It's also invulnerable. It cannot be harmed by anything in the material world. It it forms your inner eye. It forms the real you. And all truth is evaluated in your innermost thoughts, in your innermost feelings. 
And that's so critical. Truth doesn't come from the outside. We evaluate truth on the inside. And Billy, on page 258 of the Way to Live book, he says, but living according to the truth means letting go of all anxiety. And it means to learn. So the understanding of this becoming and passing, it brings us to the reality of death. And we recognize death as the passing of one level of existence into another. Now, sometimes we have anxiety about fulfilling our striving for evolution. And anxiety truthfully means learning and practically experiencing the effect of truth. So we can live without really learning. But really learning is also living. I mean, to really live means we're learning. So sometimes it's good to memorize these little phrases which jump off the page at you in the Meyer material. And then try to break the phrases down and try to come to a better understanding. One of the things I mentioned a lot of times on this show is one of Billy's writings that says, the incredible splendor of nature is the visible expression of the love of creation. And that the creation radiates love. And that love is the highest principle in all creation. And through that, everything came into existence. Love is the highest principle in creation. And through it, everything exists in absolute logic. So there's an absolute logic that exists in the universe. And that absolute logic is based on the love of the universe. The universal intelligence radiates love. And when we start to pick up on that love, it's a spiritual process called empfinding. And empfinding is a fine, sensitive feeling, a kind of awareness that comes from being able to perceive the radiating love of creation. Now, creation is the superintelligence behind our universe. It's not God. There is no God in the sense that the religions teach. The, in one way that the creation is different than this definition of God is the religions teach that God is immutable where this Meyer information teaches that the universe learns, it is evolving, and it's not perfect. And if you look at the universe, if you look at our world, you can see the imperfection. You know, animals eat animals. Um, The human being on this planet is running completely out of control. These, this is, in part, the manifestation of creation itself to a certain degree. Now, really, the blame falls on, squarely on the earth human who is not following these creational natural laws. And one of the, the first law of all living things is the law of love. Effective love, a wisdom-conditioned love. Billy's third extraterrestrial contact, a woman named Semyase, a play and woman, about 350 years old. She used to land her ship out in the clearings between the forested areas, and she would meet with Billy in the 1970s, and she would pass on the spiritual teachings to Edward Albert Meyer and she would say things like love and wisdom go together and the creation and its laws 
our love and wisdom at the same time. So there's always the wisdom aspect to love. Now, we here on the earth have confused affective love, romantic love, with effective love, which is wisdom-conditioned love. That's the love that Semyasi would tell Billy about in the middle 1970s. The romantic love that our movies place such an emphasis on is a false form of love. It's kind of a unstable love. It often turns into anger and rage, and it's not the love mentioned as a creational natural law, which is a love based on reverence and respect. This is the true love. This is the creational natural law. The second creational natural law that we could bring up, I guess, is the law of striving. And that means that you need to really focus on, on your work during your day job, evolving your consciousness in your other habits. Um, your, your whole life should have a purposefulness. And that purposefulness is also related to your thinking, your effective thinking. Your ability to set goals and your ability to have an ultimate endpoint as your destination. So one of the ways you can be purposeful in your thinking is you can write down your goals, your schedule. You can write down the times, associated time when you want to do something. So... This striving is your evolution, your personal evolution. And it, it's involved in how you work at your day job. It's involved in your work around your home. It's, it's, it's a purposeful life. When you strive, you have a life of purpose. And Billy calls it a sense of life. When you stop striving, when you your thinking gets wrong and you just, you know, get lazy or tired or whatever, you stop striving or you get discouraged. Then you can you start to spiral downhill. This is a really bad thing. So, that's the second creation of natural law, the law of striving. Animals and plants live by this law. They, they do it automatically. They also live by the law of love automatically. Every tiny plant and every tiny animal fulfills its purpose in love. This is the creation of natural law. The third creation of natural law is the law of harmony. And that's the way we think. We have to think a neutral positive to live in the law of harmony. That's the third creation of natural law. If you're not thinking in harmony, you'll let your thought boat drift around. And let's see what it says here. Unfortunately, most human beings allow their thought boats to drift unchecked on the ocean of conscious and unconscious intentions. And the unconscious setting of zeal, and that's the other thing I wanted to talk about. You, your unconscious mind can start to set goals. This is not good. Uh, the un, the in, their intentions and the setting of the zeal are, in truth, destructive and purposelessness when you're drifting in your thinking. Um, let me continue here. Let me repeat this. Unfortunately, the most human beings allow their thought boats to drift unchecked on the ocean of conscious and unconscious intentions and unconscious setting of zeal. So we start to set these destination points with our unconscious mind without becoming aware of the enormous might of our thoughts. Their intentions and the setting of zeal are in truth a destructive 
purposelessness, a vice of senseless drifting, which leads to having no success, leads to ill humor, moodiness, unfairness, egoism, and to many other bad and wrong negative aspects, which are unworthy of human beings. Well, I'm going to cut the show there. Um, I've got a ton of guests set up for this week. I might even be on tomorrow. Talk a little bit more about this. You've been listening to Ohio Exopolitics, and I'm your host, Mark Snyder. Have a great day.